The Big Bang Theory doesn't explain how exactly our cosmos started. It's more like a story about what happened after in the earliest stages of the universe. That's when all stars, galaxies, and specks of dust were crammed into a dot no bigger than a peach with a temperature of more than a trillion degrees. Our cosmos doesn't have an edge or outside. The Big Bang wasn't an explosion that happened at some particular point. It was the moment when space itself began to expand everywhere at the same time. That's a process we call inflation. When the cosmos was nearly a million times smaller than today, everything was just a plasma that later expanded, cooled, and then converted into a neutral gas. That was the time when the first atoms formed. All these processes released enormous amounts of radiation. The cosmic microwave background, CMB, is the fossil of that radiation that dates back to about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Before that, the heat from the creation of the universe was way too intense for even light to shine. Only after matter cooled down did it get lighter because the universe became less dense and more transparent. In the first three minutes of this process, certain light elements formed, such as hydrogen and helium. About 400 million years after the Big Bang, the cosmos slowly started coming out of its dark ages. This period probably lasted over half a billion years. Clumps of gas came together and formed something beautiful, the very first stars and galaxies. All this gave off lots of ultraviolet light. It was as if someone finally turned on a cosmic flashlight that cleared away the foggy gas that was all around. About 9 billion years later, our solar system got into the game too. It was born from this dense cloud of interstellar dust and gas. The cloud fell apart, possibly because of the shockwave produced by a star that exploded somewhere nearby in a spectacular supernova. This left us with a solar nebula, a disk of material that kept spinning. At its center, gravitational forces kept pulling more and more material in. At one moment, the pressure at the core became so great that hydrogen atoms started to mix and form helium. Like it happens with other processes in space, this released giant amounts of energy. And ta-da, we got our star. So big that it makes up over 90% of all the matter in our solar system. The remaining matter from the disk had its own job to do. It probably started off as grains of dust even smaller than the width of your hair. Gravity and other forces made clumps smash into one another. They got bigger and bigger. Particles of dust eventually evolved into pebbles, and then, as this donut-shaped disk of gas kept spinning, they turned into rocks. Meanwhile, the star pulled in nearby gas and pushed the rest of the material farther away. Those parts of the disk were far away from the sun, so water in those regions started to freeze. Soon, there were tiny pieces of ice flying around, gathering into dirty snowballs that became planetary cores. Since it was cold, gas molecules could slow down enough for a planet to draw them closer. That's how we got our famous gas giants, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. Jupiter and Saturn probably formed first, maybe even within the first 10 million years of the existence of our solar system. Parts of the disk that were closer to the Sun remained warm. The material there gathered into rocky planets. After the icy giants appeared, not much gas was left for the other ones, though. So, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars ended up a bit smaller. They may have taken tens of millions of years to form after the Sun was born. This is, of course, a very simplified version of how we got eight planets in our solar system. Who knows if we'll ever know the whole truth? Time went on. Space debris was swirling around. Some objects became large enough for their gravitational force to shape them into spheres. That's how we got dwarf planets and big moons. Our asteroid belt is the region that separates inner planets from outer ones. 
it's full of pieces and bits from the early solar system that never grew into something bigger. They just kept on floating around, maybe waiting for another chance. Other smaller leftovers turned into comets, meteoroids, asteroids, and small irregular moons. 4.5 billion years ago, something else arose from all that chaos. A planet almost as big as Mars collided with Earth. And the debris formed the only moon we have today. Somewhere around that time, the Sun also got to a new level. At its younger stages, it was just a ball of helium and hydrogen that still wasn't powered by fusion. Over millions of years, it got hotter and more pressurized, and finally turned into the shining star we know today. It's supposed to stay like this for a very, very long time. Around 10 billion years. Simulations scientists have made to understand the creation of the universe show that the chaos of that time was even bigger than we thought. Orbits of the giant planets probably shifted during that period, too. The gravitational force from many objects in the Kuiper Belt shook Saturn and Jupiter into a 2-1 resonance. That means Jupiter made a circle around the Sun twice for every Saturn orbit. This brought the two giants closer together, which wasn't good for their surroundings. There's a theory that Uranus didn't form where it is today, which is 20 times farther from our Sun than Earth. At this distance, there wasn't enough material to make the whole planet. That's why there's an idea that Uranus was born closer to the Sun before it got ejected farther away for some reason. Maybe that reason was the mess Jupiter and Saturn made. Some believe Neptune shares a similar destiny, together with the whole Kuiper Belt. As Uranus and Neptune were passing through the Kuiper Belt, they scattered most of the objects there. Any additional ice planets that had formed there also ended up kicked out, but in this case, entirely out of our solar system. Pieces of these scattered worlds that were located more outwardly stayed in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud, a faraway sphere of ice bodies where the majority of comets come from. In all this chaos, the inner planets got hit. Scientists think that's how we got organics and water here on Earth. That's exactly what we needed for life to start developing, somewhere 3.8 to 3.5 billion years ago. We found evidence of microbes in the hard structures they made. Those are called stromatolites. They help us understand the earliest forms of life on Earth. Up until 3 billion years ago, Mars might have also been a good place for life. The red planet used to have a thick atmosphere and a strong magnetic field, just like Earth. But unlike our planet, Mars cooled from the inside, which switched off this whole mechanism. Without its magnetic field, nothing could protect the planet from the solar wind that pulled away most of its atmosphere in just a few hundred million years. Mars used to have magnificent lakes, rivers, and water streams that left traces we can see on its surface, even today. Luckily, Earth managed to keep its water, so life continued to evolve. 2.5 billion years ago, Earth got photosynthetic organisms that started pumping oxygen into the atmosphere and helped create the entire animal and plant kingdom across the planet. Another big thing happened in our solar system later. Saturn got its astonishing rings. No one knows for sure what happened back then, but a new theory says the rings aren't as old as the planet itself. Only about a hundred million years old. At the same time, something hit our moon and left Tycho Crater, one of the most prominent craters on the lunar surface. Other planets couldn't avoid collisions either, including Earth. You already know what happened 66 million years ago. A giant asteroid triggered changes in climate and erased three-quarters of life, including dinosaurs. <laughs>